Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our weekly COVID-19 media briefing. I'm Carrie Schutte, the Public Information Officer for the Shasta County Health and Human Services Agency. We'll start with our numbers. We have a total of 6,777 confirmed cases, including um, 108 from Saturday. We've done 95,264 negative tests for a total of 102,041 tests. We have this is yesterday's numbers. I am so sorry. Do not listen to what I just said. I knew that sounded wrong as soon as I said it. This is going to be one of those days. Okay, do over. We have a total of 6,927 6, cases, including 101 from Monday. We've done 96,404 negative tests for a total of 103,331 tests. We have 60 people who are hospitalized, and of those, 13 are in the intensive care unit. Um, we have a, an available regional ICU capacity of 29.8%. Um, as you may be aware, if we go below 15%, we would be subject to that regional stay-at-home order in the state. We are the only region that is not subject to that order right now. We've had um, 6,166 people released from isolation to date. And we have had um, 63 people who have died from COVID in Shasta County. Um, I'd like to introduce everyone and then uh, we will, um, everybody has something to share today. So uh, we have Robin Schurig, she's the public health director for the Shasta County Health and Human Services Agency. Dr. Karen Ramstrom is our health officer. Mark Mitchelson is from Shasta Regional Medical Center. Robert Folden is from Mercy Medical Center Reading. And Valerie Lakey is from Mayor's Memorial Hospital District. Um, we also have Ryan Waller, who is a Disaster Preparedness Coordinator from Shasta Regional Medical Center. Um, and we will start out with uh, Robin Shirt this morning. Thank you, good morning. I wanted to just start with a quick reminder that we do have lots of testing resources available in our county. So if people need to get tested or want to get tested, they just need to visit lhi.care. Um, once you set up your account in that um, website, you will be shown a uh, selection of locations where testing is available. And if you choose the location where you want to go get tested, then you'll see the dates and times that are available. You do need to schedule an appointment, um, but we just wanted to put out a reminder that we do have those testing resources available. They are state resources. And so if we don't meet certain capacity thresholds, then the state can pull those resources and assign them to another county. So we want to make sure that those are getting used. Um, testing is important so that we can identify cases and contain the spread of disease. And it's also um, important for folks who are just uh, in contact with people on a regular basis, either if you work in a setting where you're in contact with customers or patients or even just your coworkers, it's a good idea to get tested regularly, maybe every couple of weeks. And those testing resources are available for that purpose as well. You do not have to have symptoms to get tested. Anybody can go to lhi.care to schedule an appointment. I'll pass it off to Dr. Ramstrom. Good morning, everybody. Um, so we have reached a milestone in this pandemic. Um, the FDA has approved um, and ACIP has uh, authorized also use of our first COVID-19 vaccine. It's been received in our county. And um, this is a very exciting um, opportunity for us to begin um, getting our community vaccinated and protected um, wide for individuals over the age of 16. So um, 16 years of age and older, sorry. And so um, we have received our first allocation and we're gonna be receiving ongoing, probably weekly allocations from the state um, and that will kind of smooth out over time and become more regimented um, as this moves forward. Um, so right now, a lot of logistical planning around how to make that vaccine available to those um, priority groups um, that we've been speaking about over the last couple of weeks, including our high-risk um, healthcare workers and our um, long-term care facilities, starting with skilled nursing facilities. And so um, that's in the works, and we're also planning ahead about the, the um, subsequent groups that will become eligible um, to receive vaccine as more becomes available. Um, similarly, there's a second mRNA vaccine. This first one that's approved that's um, recently arrived in our county is the Pfizer vaccine. The Moderna vaccine is in a similar place as Pfizer was last week, and 
the FDA will be reviewing that on the 17th. And again, the ACIP and Western States Scientific Safety Review will look at that over the weekend. And so we will probably have a second vaccine available to us next week. So all very exciting. Um, I listened to a couple, um, you know, groups of uh, experts over the last weekend um, that were in, involved either with the FDA review or with the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And um, these vaccine experts and infectious disease experts um, th from throughout the nation um, um, were very confident um, in the um, efficacy and safety of this vaccine and um, all felt that they would be comfortable getting it themselves. and. I'm very excited about this um, opportunity and this technology, and, um, which is very reassuring, I think, for our healthcare community and the public at large. And so um, we will be sharing more information with the community as it becomes available to additional groups as we receive more um, uh, allotments and more vaccine availability in the community. And I'm happy to answer questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ramstrom. Um, let's go over to Val from Mayor's Memorial to talk about um, what's going on over in the Intermountain area. Good morning. It's been a little while since I've been on and I felt like it was probably time to update what was happening up here in the Intermountain area. We've been pretty busy like everyone else, but um, exciting news today. We just um, administered the first round of vaccinations to staff this morning. We picked up our allotted doses yesterday. So that is big news for us here and everyone is very excited about that. And um, we also want to make sure that the community knows that we have been receiving a lot of different questions just about statistics, what's happening in the hospitals. We are putting out information weekly and if anyone is interested in knowing what's happening specifically here, they can go to our website and sign up to receive this information automatically via their email or via text. And that's been pretty successful in answering a lot of the questions that we've been fielding. And also I wanted to just note, because this is one of the big questions we've received is that Mayors does not have ICU beds. So when we receive patients that need that higher level of care, they are transferred to one of our um, partnering facilities. Um, so the ICU beds, we have negative pressure isolation rooms for COVID cases, but no ICU. And with that, I would just like to really thank our um, friends and partners at Shasta Regional and Mercy because they've been a lot of help to us in many, many situations. So I think just continued that partnership that we've had with the hospitals in Shasta County has really helped us get through all the different challenges that we've had. So that's, that's it, I think. All right, thank you so much. Let's go over to Mark Mitchelson from Shasta Regional Medical Center. Morning, guys. Uh, really kind of following the same lines about uh, vaccinations and the clinics. Uh, we have our first clinic uh, for our employees and physicians tomorrow morning and have a lot of excitement with staff and uh, around getting the shot. The uh, process is being worked out in the kinks, of course, with any new uh, clinic is being worked out. We're going to have uh, these clinics at least weekly, especially with Moderna a vaccine hopefully coming to the county next week. Um, and just for the next month or two, uh, we could definitely see weekly clinics for our employees and physicians. So anybody who will want to get the vaccine will definitely be able to get it at some point. Um, so we're really excited about that. I wanted to tag along with uh, what Valerie said around the collaboration within the county. And, you know, it's not just our county, but it's actually our neighboring counties that we're really looking at, uh, to help us. Uh, just yesterday, we got a phone call from Trinity uh, just checking in with us, making sure that we're doing okay and uh, wanting to help us and support us with uh, supplies or personnel or whatever we needed. Uh, so it was kind of nice to see a, a good North State type of uh, collaboration. So just wanted to throw that out and say thank you to Trinity County. All right, thank you, Mark. And then um, over to Robert Folden from Mercy Medical Center Reading. Good morning. So yeah, yesterday was a was a big day with the arrival of the of the vaccine itself. So we're in the process of doing our first today. So we've got uh, our tier four folks there are, are lined up and ready to go over the next three days. So, so we're excited. 
there's a lot of as as folks have mentioned there's a lot of buzz about this and it's come at a great time and then i think mm -hmm. probably, I, not, I don't want it to go without saying but i mean our i think all of us are in pretty good shape with ppe and whatnot uh, staffing looks good um well sorry i gotta pay my electric bill here real quick there we go um we're, we are still very cautious going into the Christmas season. So, you know, for those of us that are here inside the hospital, we know that next week could could be another potential surge. So while we have many good things going our way, we're also prepared for things uh, if we do see an increase. And, and we are seeing a slow rise in numbers again this week. So, so we're prepared. I want the community to know that we're prepared, we're ready. Um, but the vaccine will certainly help as we get this out. All right, thank you, Robert. I think we are ready for media questions. Good morning, everybody. This is Anna here from um, Channel 1224. I just wanted to touch base. Sorry, I think I somewhere along the lines mark and robert i think you got cut off did you guys administer yet uh your first doses of vaccines our clinic is today anna and ours is tomorrow wait sorry can you say that one more time? it started overlapping uh yeah uh so mercy's is later today and ours is tomorrow morning Okay, cool. So, Robert, just want to make sure you guys will be starting to administer your first shots today. Yes. And we have already, we did ours this morning. We just finished everyone that was scheduled for today, this morning, and then the second half will go tomorrow. Thank you. And then I also have, this one's for all the hospitals on here. Um, how will you guys be assigning who who will be able to get it the vaccines first? Like, will it be doctors, nurses? Like, what's the the order here of who's getting the vaccine? So the order is really distinguished by the county and CDC. Uh, they've created clear guidance that we want to have frontline high risk of people uh, administered first before anybody else. So that may be your emergency department, anesthesia, uh, people in those type of areas. Uh, before we go to people in a lower risk area of the hospital. So that, that structure, Anna, is set up around a tier system. So, and there are points that, that a individual gets based on where they work, race, ethnicity, you know, maybe even the type of work that they do. So the, the more points a person receives puts them in tier four. And that's the tier that we're going after first. And to Mark's point, those are typically the people that are caring. Think of that like the people that are taking care of COVID patients. And then a person like me, or maybe even Mark or Valerie, uh, I get no points. <laughs> so I'm there with the general population. So I'd, I'd be, you know, I don't even have a tier. Okay, thank you for that. And then um, I also wanted to follow up with, um, this was also for the hospitals, Robert, you mentioned that Mercy is, you know, preparing for, um, you know, Christmas, but you guys say that you're good right now. How is the ICU capacity for Shasta Regional and Mercy handling right now at this time? Uh, pretty stable at this point. Uh, I think the percentage within Northern California region kind of shows that, you know, I'm not saying that it's not tight and, you know, you get up to that 25%. Uh, area of the hospitals, it's still fairly tight, but uh, right now we have flexibility to maintain operations. Yeah, and I'll, I will be a broken record. Our, our ICU, we have 33 beds. Our ICU is often uh, close to being full, but that's the nature of being a level two trauma. So I, I believe this morning we have a fair number of COVID positive patients in our ICU that we're caring for. 
but part of that preparation that all of us did is the potential to surge. And as I mentioned last week, if there's one wish that I could have about the daily tool that we report into the state, it would be under surge capacity. And I wish there was a section that carved out potential out of that potential surge, how many of those beds would be ICU beds? Because I think that would give many people uh, some calmness that, that there's additional capability there when needed. All right, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Okay, good. I'm having trouble with my microphone again. Uh, I, I don't know if it's the county or, or Robert or whom, but could you tell us the number of vaccine uh, doses and where they're going? Like, you know, to which different facilities? Do we have a number on that? Well, as part of our, as part of our plan, we received 1,950 doses, but that is for region three. So really I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer to Dr. Ramstrom. Um, right. Sorry, it took a minute to unmute. So um, we are starting, we've been looking at our, at the allocations from the state. And as Robert said, we have 1,950 initial doses of the Pfizer vaccine for our county. And so um, what we've done is we've, um, since the hospitals are the first line in tier one for prioritization, we've um, basically disseminated it to the hospitals in our county based on um, the number of healthcare workers that they have, and so we've split that up. It certainly is not enough to meet all of the need, but it's a good start starting point. And so the additional prioritization, as Robert was mentioning earlier, is sometimes um, necessary as well. So um, that's our first step. And then um, we have some preliminary numbers about our Pfizer allocation for next week, but it has not been um, finalized by the CDC at the state level. And so that's still in the works. And then in addition to all of that, um, we're really, um, um, thankful for Mercy's um, partnership in um, not only storing for our county, but they're also storing this vaccine and helping to make it available to our surrounding counties. Um, because this vaccine has to be uh, shipped in a minimum um, allotment of just under a thousand doses, and these smaller counties can't take that amount, let alone uh, store at ultra low temperatures. And so um, there's a lot of logistical planning going on right now, and so these numbers are going to sort of be evolving over the um, next few weeks, and then I think we'll get into more of a regular regimen where we'll, we will have a better idea about what we can anticipate coming. Um, our allocation for the Moderna is next week, if that's approved, is 2,000 doses, and so we probably will be in a similar situation as we were with the Pfizer this week, receiving it early in the week, and so we'll again be doing a lot of looking at um, what are priority groups and what, how much have they gone through and should we give another round to the hospitals or do we move on to other groups? And so will it be an iterative process in communication with all of these entities and working together to, to meet the need? But do you have a number for, you know, how many went up to the mayor's memorial or how many are at Mercy, how many are at SRMC? So, so we did, we did an uh, initial um, up to amount for each of the facilities. I don't have it right in front of me, but it was about, as, as Robert said, about 1,100 doses for Mercy. Um, I don't remember, a little bit over 500, I believe, for SRMC. Um, I, I remember 75, maybe it was 100 or so, I don't recall exactly, um, for, for mayors. But we, we split that up and, they, and just to give them some initial planning numbers and that they could... Um, go back periodically to Mercy to get additional doses because they have to plan these clinics. It's a lot of logistics on their part. They actually have to pick up this um, vaccine at Mercy um, using specialized equipment to transport it to their facility to keep it at the right temperature, monitoring the temperature the whole time. And they have to have the clinic planned in advance so that they can actually um, administer this vaccine within um, five days, 120 hours at the most from picking it up from Mercy, taking it out of Mercy's freezer. And so um, those are sort of a lot of the, um, the little details that um, all of these facilities are dealing with, which is, um, it is a huge task. And so they might pick up 50 doses today and then 50 doses in a couple days from now. And so depending on what their needs are and their 
capacity and how many people are signed up for their clinics. Thank you, doctor. Uh, Robert, you said you got started today. What's the process of uh, inoculating the, the staff there? And do you kind of only do some of it given that there could be, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, a, a reaction to, to, to the shots? So, so you don't want it to uh, give everybody a shot at the same time? Sure. So, so for us, Mike, we're using, we're attempting to use uh, kind of a front end process where folks can pre-register. Um, like any good process, we always have a manual backup and we're glad we have a manual backup today because we'll be doing everything on paper this week. Uh, but there's a registration process, there's a consent process, we provide information on the emergency use authorization itself as well because we want people to be fully informed. And then the actual immunization is like a flu shot or any other immunization. It's just a simple IM injection. And then we ask, we're asking our, our folks to, to stay in the area. We have a separate uh, part of the vaccination area set up for waiting. So we just wanna monitor folks for 20 minutes to half an hour, depending upon them before we release them. Um, and then to your other question about reactions. So like any vaccine, we expect that some people may have some type of reaction and that could be anything from a little bit of soreness to redness to, you know, maybe within 24 hours feeling symptoms like the flu or whatnot. We believe that that might be more prevalent on the second dose than the first dose. So actually we're, we're probably a little more concerned about the timing of that second dose uh, than we are this first round. But pretty pretty straightforward. I think the big the big difference is just the information that people need to have around the vaccine itself. And is this like the flu shot? Um, is it optional or is it mandatory for your staff? No, nope, it's optional. Thanks, Robert. And then I think the other, at least for us, we, we, we did a poll over the weekend. We had about a 55% of our staff who responded indicated that they were considering receiving the vaccine. So I think across the nation, we see somewhere between 50 and 60% of, of people want to participate in vaccine programs. So we got a very similar response. So. All right, other questions? Hi there, this is Matt from the Record Searchlight newspaper in Reading. I just wanted to ask about that last question. So what happens if a person who would normally be working with COVID patients says they don't wanna take the vaccine? Uh, they, they don't take the vaccine. Even if people take the vaccine, we're still asking, they, we still need to follow the same PPE, we still need to follow the same precautions. And, it, and then Mike, I think you had one other question that I didn't answer, and that is each vial contains roughly five doses. So we're, we're being very methodical, and I'm, I'm sure Valerie and, and Mark are doing the same around sort of when you get towards the end of the day, let's say, we wanna make sure that we make the most of that vaccine so we do have people on standby that if if now we've we're into that last vial and we only have two people on our list well we've got people on standby so that we don't waste any of this vaccine what's the shelf life like once you open up the package i'm val <laughs> I, I, I believe it depends on what environment it's in, Mike. Six hours. Yeah, it, it's uh, about six hours when it's mixed. So there's, you know, it's got its, it's got its life in the freezer. It's got its life in the refrigerator. It's got its life once that it's uh, reconstituted. Got it. So you can't put it back in the freezer. <laughs>
Matt, did you have any other questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that. So for if if staff at a uh, hospital doesn't want to get vaccinated, can and the, will the hospital be trying to get that number up? 55% of staff saying they're considering taking it. Is there anything the hospital can do to try and increase that number? I'd imagine it makes it easier uh, to deal with a high number of patients when you have more people vaccinated. So, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that we had we had probably about the same. We sent out a survey also on Friday, and we had probably three quarters of our staff respond, and then of that three quarters, about sixty percent say yes. But we are sending out um, educational materials and messaging nearly every day, and I think a lot of the hesitancy is just because they don't know and understand. So we're trying to provide that education that we need to to our staff. And I've already seen a change from Friday to today when we started doing the vaccinations. I just sitting here on this press conference, I've had five emails come in from staff that say they've changed their mind. So I think that just as we get more education out there, and that's our job to do that to make sure that our staff understands, you know, what the what the pros and cons are, and just to understand what the process is. Yeah, Matt, I was just going to add that. Remember, that was just a poll. So when polls turn into practice, we usually see a better adoption rate. And I think for many people, because it is a brand new uh, vaccine, they're, they're going to, to watch how the first few clinics go and they're gonna see whether people have reactions or not. And then my hypothesis is that more people are gonna participate. Yeah, that's kind of, kind of what we're seeing over here too, some people wanting just to wait until next week, next week's clinic, to see how everybody else did this week. And uh, no, no shame in that. Just, uh, I'm just happy that they're willing to get the vaccine at some point. Gotcha, thank you. And I know that uh, you mentioned with the vaccine prioritization in the hospital that a lot of it depends on high risk people. You wanna get them vaccinated first. Do we know how long it would take to get all of our hospital staff vaccinated? How many months or weeks? That is an excellent question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that by saying we've set our clinics up around the number 240, and we feel that in a four-hour period we can easily vaccinate 240 individuals. So now that we once we have confidence in the supply, we can scale that up or scale that back. So our our goal I think would be to try and have this done certainly before the first of the year. Great, thank you. It'd be, could I also hear from uh, the other two hospitals on that? Sure. Uh, For us, it'd be a lot easier. Sorry, Mark, I keep doing that to you. No, 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 right, right. We have a lot less staff. We, our staff is, it'll take us probably three, three weeks, maybe just doing a clinic one or two days a week. So by next week, we would probably have 75% of our staff completed. Right, and uh, same for us. We're hoping that uh, the next few weeks, we should be able to get everybody the initial injection and then in 21 days be able to complete the, the roll. Gotcha, thank you. And then do we know, um, not for hospitals, but just for the county as a whole, how many people have been vaccinated so far, uh, you know, that first day? And will we be keeping a running tally of the number of people vaccinated on our county website or daily updates? I would ask Val because she's the one who's vaccinated so far. So she would have our totals for the county right now. We have done, I believe, 25 this morning. And there's another 25 tomorrow. So we, we received 50 doses initially to answer your question, Mike. I think we were allotted 125 and we picked up 50 yesterday. So we still have some at Mercy. So we, we took a small amount just to make sure that we were, um, our clinic was running smoothly. So 25 so far. And then Matt, over time, um, so all of this is tracked in terms of 
which facilities pick up how many doses and then the vaccination. Um, so we'll, we'll over time, um, that's done in communication between these facilities in the county and our um, data collection systems. And so we'll be able to track that information over time, but we're not gonna have it, um, you know, real, real time necessarily, but some periodicity we'll be able to um, compile that information. Gotcha, thank you. And then I also wanted to ask about an interesting stat you guys put out, or the public uh, health or HHSA, it was put out a stat last week saying that uh, for COVID patients in our county, they tend to spend longer amounts of time in the ICU than they do in other counties, and they tend to spend longer amounts of time in the hospital. For the ICU, it was, you know, the average was about 10 days statewide, and in Shasta County, it said it's 17. This is for COVID patients in the ICU. And I wonder, uh, do we know why that's happening? And what is the effect of that? Does that strain hospital resources? You know, what, I'd just uh, it'd be great to hear any context on why we think that's happening and what their effects are. You know, I know our epidemiologists look at that. I don't know what was um, shared. Um, I think that we have some hypotheses, but I don't know that we that we know for sure. I think we have a um, a population in our community that's older and that has um, more underlying health conditions. Um, so we could hypothesize that that might be the reason. Um, but you know, it you know, it may be that um, Mark or Robert have an idea just about those. Um, um, you know those uh, hospital stays, um, but I don't know that we have we have a definitive answer yet. I think that's a good statement. Uh, don't see any trends that are different than the rest of the state of California. Um, while the, those numbers are a little bit different, I don't see any dissonant uh, things that aren't similar uh, to the care that everybody else is getting. Uh, yes, you know, the longer length of stays in, in the ICU puts a little bit more of a strain of resources and manpower, uh, but, you know, nothing, it, it looks different in, over here than it is in like Southern California or San Francisco. Yeah, and the only other comment I would add is that we tend to have a larger number of folks who typically don't seek care. So, you know, our case mix index, which is one of those things that we track patient to patient tends to be a little higher here in the North State. And then that, that population of people who typically don't have access to care is higher in the North State. So that would be a suggestion on why. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's helpful. Um, good to hear those ideas. And then I also wanted to ask, I, I believe this would be my last question. I read that uh, in the state's update yesterday, the CDPH uh, is letting hospitals increase their nurse to patient ratios um, in ICUs and other units. Uh, and I wonder, you know, is that something that we have to do in our hospitals here uh, in our county? Have our hospitals been having forced to increase their nurse to patient ratios because of this and what that could mean for patient care? Yeah, to, to date, we have maintained our ratios. Um, uh, clearly, as part of our surge plan, we if if we got to that point, we would we would make use of that. But to date, we have not. Uh, same here. Uh, to date, we have not. Same. Okay. I think, I think that's I what we have. Matt, I would add in that category that there are many uh, there are many things that the state has done for us that that simplify our ability to respond. So even OSHPOD, which is the Office of Statewide Hospital Planning and Development, has come out with guidelines on things that we can do that allow us to act and then um, let's say submit a permit or submit formal plans for re for review. But really, the state's been pretty. I'm going to say I'm going to say fair and reasonable with us here recently on respond and keep us informed. That's kind of the the mantra, if you will. And this is another example. Thank you. Any other media questions? 
Hi, sorry, Anna here. I just had a couple more I wanted to follow up on. I know we're supposed to get, um, we have Pfizer now, and then Moderna is expected to come next week. Will, um, this one's for the hospitals, for all three. When those come in, will uh, staff have a choice to pick between the Pfizer or the Moderna once it's approved? So um, I guess I would just say that we're as we have a task force, including the hospitals and other um, healthcare coalition and healthcare facility partners um, that we're working with um, collaboratively on figuring out the best way to get this vaccine out. And so um, I think that's a question that our task force is going to have to talk about. I mean, should we make the should we have the Moderna, which has less? Um, it's a little easier in terms of um, storage and handling. Should we make that available more for our outpatient clinics and have the hospitals work with this um, vaccine that requires more um, care in terms of the ultrapole storage? Or um, maybe it will be a mix. I think there's the you know and and what are the what are the logistical um, implications for a facility having more than one kind of vaccine? Maybe over time. Um, it, we would want to do that so that we would have more options for for healthcare workers and other staff um, who might be more comfortable with one type than another. Um, I think all of that's yet to be determined, and I think um, we, we'll have to work together to figure out what makes the most sense. And it could change over time as the supplies change too. Thank you. And then I also wanted to ask about skilled nursing facilities because I know first it's. It's going to be, you know, at the hospital workers who are working with high risk patients. What about skilled nursing facilities? What is their timeline also going to look like? Because they're part of that uh, tier one group. Right. So we are working right now to figure out. Um, so there's a CDC um, pharmacy partnership that is set to implement um, the last week of December. And um, I believe all but one of our um, facilities is signed up for that partnership, will, which will allow either CVS or, Wal or Walgreens to come into the facility and help vaccinate their healthcare um, workers and their residents. And so that's going to be um, really helpful for those facilities to access um, vaccine for those who, who want to get vaccinated. Um, in the interim, we are thinking about how can we vaccinate that population um, both healthcare workers and residents. Um, luckily, we have like Mayors has a skilled nursing facility and Vibra Hospital, which has received vaccine, has has some of those um, healthcare workers and patients, and so our residents. So that might be that's an initial way to get to that population. In addition, um, before the end of the month, we are considering um, working with um, Chest Community Health Center it has offered to partner with us to help get um, people vaccinated and. Um, we may um, try and make that option available, um, like through a drive up option, for example, some clinics for the skilled nursing facility healthcare workers. So all of that's in the planning mode right now. And so we hope to have more information on that in the next few days. Thank you. And I just have a couple more questions. Um, I know, how about the timeline for the public? Is it something they'll probably be getting later next year, at the beginning of next year? What's their timeline for the general public looking like? Yeah, you know, it really depends on vaccine supplies. I've heard maybe towards the spring. Um, and so, you know, we're really early and there's several um, different vaccines in the pipeline, and which is great because that allows us more, um, you know, Th this is this is a new product and so the more companies and more types of vaccine we have in development the more likely we're going to be successful in having vaccines um, that that work and that work for different types of populations and so um, as those come along and as supplies increase um, I think we'll better be able to project that um, but right now early on um, I think it's a little bit difficult but even with these um, initial um, two vaccines the Pfizer and Moderna um, I, I believe the national projections are looking at sometime in the spring um, getting um, toward to the um, general population. But, you know, we're going to be continuing to look at this and it's it's an ever evolving situation. And so um, we'll we'll share as we know. Thank you. And I just have a few more and then additional allocation. Will those additional allocations be coming in weekly? Because I believe um, the county is expecting to receive about 530 more doses of Pfizer, correct? <laughs> 
Right, that's an estimate. Um, this, the, as I said, the, the state is waiting to hear for sure from CDC what that is, um, what the allocation is. We've been talking with them as well about um, that amount. And so um, we should hear in the next few days once the state um, hears from CDC about our final state allocation. Um, in addition, um, that it, this allocation is going to look a little bit different because they're taking those 80 or 85,000 doses for the CDC pharmacy partnership off the top. And so this particular round is going to be a little bit lower statewide um, because we're going to be able to make it available, um, as I said, to our skilled nursing facilities. So, um, so it might be a little bit um, 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 uneven in terms of the, the allocation and trying to figure it out over the next couple of weeks, but the state's confident that um, very soon we'll get to where we have more of a regimented kind of regular weekly allocation that will be coming. We're running a bit over on time, Anna. So if you could do maybe one more question and then anything else I can help you with offline. Oh yeah, it was only one more question. I only have one more promise. Um, so I did see an interesting article the other day about you know surge going up. Um, can we see the field hospital possibly being set up here again in the county? Just want to know. No. <laughs> you know, our plan, Anna, if, if we have to go to that point, we're going to set up an alternative care site at the college. That resource, that federal, I believe it's a federal resource, is no longer available to us. Thank you. All right. Any other quick questions? I have a question for everyone's benefit. Uh, with Christmas and New Year's coming, are you still planning on these news uh, briefings every Wednesday? We may be on a skeleton crew for the next couple of weeks, but I am committed to being here and, and providing uh, this this um, service for all of you for the both weeks, the 23rd and the 30th. So we'll see who joins us. It might just be you and me, Mike, but um, but we will be here for sure. You might be all by yourself, uh, Carrie, but thank you. <laughs> That'll make it really quick. <laughs> Any other questions? Quick question for Robin. Oops, sorry, we can hear you, Johnny. Go ahead. We could hear you for a second, but now we cannot. Oh, good. Um, Robin, you mentioned about testing sites. Is it a matter of, okay, shoot. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so yeah. Robin, about the testing sites, is it a use it or lose it kind of situation if the test sites are not used? Yes, so the state um, has established capacity thresholds that we have to meet, and if we don't meet those, then they would start having conversations with us about, do you really need these testing sites? Should we be giving them to another county that maybe needs them more? So yes, it is basically use it or lose it. All right, Johnny, did you have any other questions? Looks like you turned red, so that looks like a no. No, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us, and we will see you again uh, next Wednesday, the 23rd at 11 a.m. Everyone stay safe and healthy.